Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Carissa Crane. I'm at the University of Dayton, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to give you some thoughts about uh, the teacher-scholar model. So my role in this, um, in this session is to think about how it is that you can build a career around teaching that includes research and scholarship in a meaningful and productive way. So just to give you a little background on who I am, um, I have been a faculty member at the University of Dayton for the past 16 years. That was my first faculty position. It's a tenure line position. I went through the gauntlet, so I, I achieved promotion and tenure, uh, full professor, promotion to full professor, and I, I currently hold the, an inaugural chair position in the biology department. Along the way, I've held some really interesting and um, enjoyable service positions. I was the associate director of the honors program for honors thesis research at the university. I've also held a shared governance position as the president of the academic senate and professionally I've served on the education committee. So I've had a, an opportunity to really diversify what I do as a teacher and as a scholar through these service activities. So a little bit about the University of Dayton. We're a mid-size University, we're a private Marianist Catholic institution. As a private institution, we have high enrollment standards, so uh, we get students who are achieving probably the top uh, quarter of ACT and SAT scores. Uh, we're mid-sized, 8,600 undergraduates with a, several graduate programs in a law school. And we have uh, units that you've, you see there, College of Arts and Sciences, Engineering, Education, Health Science, Business, Law, and Libraries, all academic units. So there's a lot of words up here, but one of the things that as, it, as a private institution that I have found to be a, a very nice and consistent mantra is the mission of the university. As a private institution, we can decide who it is we are and what it is that we want to do, and we're not dependent upon who might be occupying the state house, for example. So our mission is driven by the ideas that we're educating the whole person, we're educating for an emerging society. We uh, value the development of knowledge, we value community engagement, and we incorporate that into student learning outcomes in the classroom, co-curricular and experiential learning opportunities, professional development for faculty, and even our P our P&T process. So when I first uh, got my job, and this is typical of, of tenure line positions in the sciences at the University of Dayton, uh, my contract basically put out uh, the 40% teaching, 40% research, and 20% service expectation. And that was what was on paper. When I first started my job, I quickly learned that what's on paper isn't the reality of how it is that you're evaluated or where you spend your time. So in terms of merit and T&P, what was quite evident within the first two years of the P&T process during a pre-tenure evaluation is that research in my department was about 55%, 30% teaching, and 15% service. Then I looked at my calendar and I said, well, do I really spend my time in that way? And what I learned again quite quickly is that during the academic year about 50% of my time was spent teaching, 30% in service, and 20% research. And then the summers were much better with regard to teaching and, and service opportunities, but as you can see, uh, it, it really doesn't add up. So it's a moving target. So how do you manage this? So here's how you manage it. You don't try to. Um, what do you have to do? You have to teach. You have to do research, you have to do service, but then there's everything else, right? Everything else that is small but takes small bits of your time. So although the priorities are laid out in front of you, you find yourself doing everything else. So it becomes a composite of what you do at the university on behalf of the mission of the university, on behalf of your, your department, your department needs, but also your professional career. And at UD, we emphasize the student, the student experience, our collaborators, our students, and our teaching in the classroom is commensurate with our research expectations. So expectations for T&P, uh, we have a moderate teaching 
expectation. So we have one undergraduate lecture and supervise the accompanying labs. We have one undergraduate uh, seminar per semester, a graduate seminar. We do have a graduate program for masters and graduate students. Uh, one of our expectations at the university is that we mentor undergraduate and graduate students in our lab. That is actually an expectation written in our TNP bylaws. So this isn't something that we're doing on the side. This is actually part of our job description, which I think is probably a really good thing because it helps us then um, monitor our time and devote our efforts towards this area. Our our teaching is evaluated in a number of different ways, so we need to demonstrate at or above department average student evaluations of teaching, so these are the student evaluations. Then we have peer evaluations, and the peer evaluations are members of the faculty come and sit in your classroom and uh, review all of your teaching materials, have a discussion with you, and produce a letter of assessment. And our peer evaluations need to be strong, positive, enthusiastic for T&P purposes. And then we need to demonstrate student learning outcomes for the courses that we teach. For research, we're expected to publish. We're expected to be senior first or corresponding author on publications from UD. Um, our students are expected to be listed as co-authors on these publications, and they should be in high-tier journals. We are expected to get external funding in the form of grants and contracts. Uh, NSF, NIH, American Lung, American Heart are among some of the funding agencies that we have successfully received grants from. We're expected to attend conference, conferences and present, uh, engage in invite, invited seminars, and undergraduate, mentor undergraduate and graduate students that lead to deliverables, so student presentations, abstracts, thesis, and dissertations. And then for service at the pre-tenure level, department service, academic advising, undergraduate and graduate student mentorship are all part of our service ex expectations, which then expand when you're uh, an associate professor, you're expected to gauge more broadly in the university and in the community. So that's a little bit about the teacher-scholar model at the University of Dayton. I think it's probably similar to other institutions our size, where research and teaching are expectations. So what are, what are some of the things that you need to think about if you are thinking about this kind of career? Uh, first, mentors are critical. So um, if you are thinking about being a teacher and a scholar and managing service in a, an institution that's sort of mid-size, recognize that your colleagues have probably struggled with the same things that you have or are as a pre-tenure person, that in the classroom, everyone struggles with something, and it shouldn't be a private struggle. You should tap the, the resources and, and the wisdom of your colleagues. If you're struggling with a particular class, if you're struggling with a particular concept, if you get bad teaching evaluations that first time out, talk to somebody, and they're likely to say, oh yeah, I've been there, gosh, when I first, when I first taught, you should have seen, I, my, oh, they were in the basement, and here's what I did and they can give you some really helpful hints. So it's, it's not a private event. It, it, teaching is, is a, a team sport, and so mentors are really important there. Recognize that there's no such thing as balancing your workload. Uh, we, we have articles that are published all the time about balancing your academic career. There's no such thing as balance. Um, you, you come into a, an academic advising period where you're advising students about what courses to take for the next semester. That week on your calendar is done. It's gone. Just write it off and don't try and write your next grant during that week. Instead, spend the time with the students, pay attention to them, do your job the way it has to be done, and then the next week start on that grant. So there's no such thing as balancing workload. Um, if, if you embrace that, you'll be much less stressed than trying to do everything all the time. Understand your department's expectations. This is hard to navigate, and it goes, it, when coming through, you, you see what you're supposed to be doing in your contract, and then you know the realities of how you spend your day. And so by talking to trusted colleagues, you can kind of figure out, what, where should I be spending my time? How am I doing in, in this particular way? How do I manage this? Where can I kind of cut my effort a little bit in this area to bolster this other area? So knowing what your department is expecting of yourself as a faculty member in teaching, research, and service is really important. 
Finding synergies between your teaching, your research, and your service can be very advantageous. The synergies that, that it naturally exist. So for example, if you are teaching a laboratory course, is there a way that you can develop a laboratory experiential learning that could lead to a publication in, in advances, for example? Um, is there a way that some project that you are doing in a class could lead to a student group presenting at EB? Is there a way that you can develop your pedagogy, which then lends towards developing a model in your research program where you can address a, a research question using undergraduate and graduate student interest in that research question? So finding synergies between the areas that you are engaging in your teaching, research, and service can be very advantageous. Promote and celebrate successes. So it's, it's a long haul. Um, going through tenure and promotion can be a very daunting experience, but if you celebrate the small successes along the way, um, have a lab party when you get a paper published, um, celebrate a student getting an award for a poster presentation that they had on, at a local event, celebrate these things, um, make it meaningful to you and your department. Sometimes we're not very good at advocating for ourselves, but guaranteed your PR or your communications department for your university wants to know of your successes and the successes of your student. Your advancement office, the people who find money for your university, they wanna know when your students win an award for research. They wanna, they wanna publish that. And so celebrate those successes. And by doing so, they'll let, you let the, the university know all of the good things that you're doing on behalf of the university as well. View your students as collaborators, especially, this is especially true for undergraduates and graduate students who might be working with you on research projects or senior seminar courses or honors thesis projects or experiential learning group projects. View them as collaborators. Push them to be independent. Push them to really use their creativity that might be stifled in you because of all of the things that you have to do. They have brilliant ideas. And if you treat them as collaborators, they will rise to the occasion and can really um, promote what you are doing and, and advance all of the student learning outcomes that you're seeking. Pursue a diversity of funding opportunities for the work that you want to do, especially those that are commensurate with uh, bringing together that teaching and research mission. So the APS undergraduate, uh, summer undergraduate research fellowships, they're wonderful. They support undergraduates for the summer to do research in your lab, $4,000 stipends. Plus they send that student to EB, $1,300 to send them to EB. That's a wonderful example of how it is that you're supporting students, you're supporting their learning. It's a, a fabulous act, activity for your students, but it also, again, raises the prestige of your university in the eyes of a professional society. So education grants. Um, don't go for that R01 right off the bat. Go for something small, something small that incorporates students into what you're doing. Show that you're fundable at the research level, and then once you're fundable, deliver on what you promise, and then you poise yourself for bigger grants. Always keeping in mind that students can be uh, a really important part of all of your grant applications. Recognize, too, that sometimes it has to be good enough. This is really hard for scientists. We are perfectionists by nature, and we, we strive for that perfect lecture that's going to win us the Pulitzer Prize. Okay, so if you think about the, the 17 hours that you're going to put in to incrementally increase the impact of that one lecture, um, you can probably say, uh, not worth it, right? So it, sometimes you just have to say, it's good enough. Given everything else that I have to manage, I have to get this paper out. Yeah, I could work 20 more hours to just make it perfect, but it's good enough. Get it off my desk, get that grant submitted, get that lecture finished. Uh, so it's really hard to do, um, but sometimes you just have to recognize that it's not gonna be the perfect body of work um, at the moment. Select strategic service. So everyone does service, okay? So as a, an academic, you, you serve the community. You serve your academic community, you serve your university, your department. But some service is better than others, okay? And 
strategically selecting the service that you do can be really important. For example, as a pre-tenure person, maybe being on your undergraduate curriculum committee and thinking about what courses are being taught and how they're being taught and how they're being assessed would be a really valuable service. If you're gonna do service, make it meaningful. Being part of shared governance, knowing how your university works, knowing how T&P is decided, knowing how merit works, this can be really, really advantageous service opportunities. So strategically select your service. And the last point is remember, you're a scientist and you're doing your dream job. You're having fun. And this is fun. It's got to be fun, right? And if you've lost the fun in it because you're so in the weeds, poke your head out and really say, I am doing my dream job. If somebody would ask me, what would I do? What would my best summer job be? Being a scientist. What would be my dream job? being a scientist, being a scientist who gets to teach the next generation of physiologists. That's a dream job, so remember that. When things get really hairy, remember that this is what, what you thrive on. This is your soul's work, and it really is fun. So with that, um, I'll close. Do we have time for questions? Or? No, okay, thank you.